Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. I'm Rustin Leno, and today I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Bart Jacobs, who um, has been an intern with us um, for a long stretch of time, um, about a year almost, I think. And um, he was uh, extremely productive during uh, those internships, and um, we were sad to see him go, but um, it was good that he did, because he has gone and done uh, wonderful things in, in all those years. And um, uh, one of those achievements has been, uh, well, he's worked on checkers for dynamic frames, for implicit dynamic frames, which uh, I think that the implicit dynamic frames, uh, some of those ideas he had when he was here, and he was um, trying to convince me that they were good ideas, and in, in retrospect, they were really great ideas. So um, he's, um, uh, in the last several years, been working quite a bit with his uh, very fast uh, verifier, uh, which uh, takes both uh, C and Java as, as input, and then uh, the programs are specified using separation logic. Now, separation logic is used in, in many contexts, but, uh, but his tool really makes it a reality that you can actually make use of it in, uh, in specifying the programs. And uh, if, you, um, if you see Bart only every so often, you turn around and then all of a sudden there are new uh, wonderful features that are so impressive in the tool and um, that happens constantly. So today he's going to tell us about uh, one of those, which is um, a modular, um, I think, uh, termination well, checking. Actually, he'll a couple he'll of probably them. explain what it is. <laughs> right. So welcome. Thanks, Rustin. So actually, I'll be talking about four new features, uh, or actually three new features and one new, well, one proof that so all of it actually. Done in the last month. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. <laughs> Um, so uh, I'll, let's see if we get through all of it. Um, so actually, these are the, the things I will talk about. Uh, the first one is modular termination verification. So uh, recently, I added support for proving not just partial correctness, but also total correctness of programs to very fast. So you can prove that programs terminate. Or uh, if you don't want them to terminate, you can also prove that they are live, that they are responsive. Um, so that's the first thing I will talk about. The second thing is the part which is not really a new feature, but which is um, like the foundations of some of very fast. Um, and so this is in the context of recent developments in the concurrency verification world. So people have come up with very intricate and very uh, sophisticated um, higher order logics for very specifying and verifying concurrency. But actually, there is a very unsophisticated way of verifying fine-grained concurrency, and that's what is implemented in very fast. Uh, by the way, all of these sophisticated ones don't have tool support yet. Uh, they're all, they only exist in uh, proof assistance, so you have to use them very laboriously and interactively. This one is supported in very fast, uh, and I will talk about that. And then thirdly, I will talk about uh, provably live exception handling. Um, so most programs that you write, at least in Java, they will not be live. That is, in the presence of exceptions, they might deadlock. And uh, in .NET, it's slightly better, because since version 2.0, if a thread terminates with an exception, the entire process is killed. But that's not, still not quite the, the behavior you want. So I'll talk about how to deal with that and how to verify then these programs in the third part. And in the third, fourth part, uh, I will talk about verifying hello world. So we recently achieved verification of hello world after a long time. Um, so usually people, I mean, it's a site. People don't really concentrate on that kind of programs. Typically, we only prove that we don't crash. We don't prove that the program actually does something. <laughs> uh, and so that in the fourth part, I will talk about features for specifying and verifying that the program actually does something useful. OK, so let's first look at modular termination verification. And for that, I have a different slide deck. Um, tab. OK, it's still in. There we go. 
All right. So this is work I did with people in the Netherlands. So first, what is the problem precisely? Um, so it's not just termination verification, it's modular termination verification. That's what makes it slightly um, new, the approach. I mean, people have known how to verify termination for a long time. It's harder to see how to do it in a modular way, especially in the presence of dynamic binding. So if you have a programming language like, for example, Java or C Sharp with interfaces, and the methods are virtual methods, therefore, are dynamically bound, how to give a contract how to specify these methods such that you can prove, such that the proof of each module separately, when taken together, implies that the entire program terminates. That's the question. So, um, so for example, how to specify these methods. And you want to prevent, for example, that this implementation verifies. You want to reject this implementation. Uh, this is one where the intersection method delegates the work to the object it passed in as an argument. Right? So you want to check whether the, the receiver object intersects some other set. And to do that, you ask the other set whether it intersects you. Right? It's, for partial correctness, that's perfectly fine. For total correctness, that's not fine because you're not doing any work. Uh, and so if you implement, incl uh, instantiate such a, such a set, and then you call intersects on it, passing itself in, then you have an infinite loop. So how to catch that? Um, so what, so of course, one proof system is one that, that disallows everything. That, so that you can, cannot prove anything. That's perfectly sound, but it's not useful. So we want to allow many programs, including this one. So we have an implementation of set that is the empty set. So it doesn't contain anything. It doesn't intersect with anything. We have the set that equals some other set plus one element inserted into it. So it contains some element x if x equals alum, or uh, the other set contains x. And then um, this set intersects with another set if the other set contains, um, um, actually this should, this should be alum instead of this, right? Or the other set intersects with, um, with other. OK, so that's fine. Uh, we, should, we want to also support uh, if a set is based on top of another set. Uh, for example, if you define the union of two sets, for example, this way, um, and then you have to find another union. Um, so the reason why I give this example is because you might think that you, say, uh, that you can prove termination by looking at the size of the sets that it has to go down at each call. But here, the size of the sets doesn't go down at each call, because here you simply uh, delegate to another class without doing any work yourself. But it's a class that's earlier in the program. And we will also want to support that. OK, so these are some examples that we want to support. Um, now, the proposed solution is built on top of separation logic. So I first, I'm going to quickly uh, recall separation logic for object-oriented programs before adding the new feature uh, that I propose. So how to, how to specify partial correctness for such an interface? So what you typically define is, in separation logic, is you define a predicate that um, abstractly denotes the resources required by the set. So it, uh, in, more specifically, it will denote the memory locations that comprise the set's representation. So the, the, the fields of the objects that the set uses to, to, to store its own state. That's what is represented by this predicate. So then the contains method will require that you give it access to the set. Uh, since the contains method doesn't modify the set, it only requires some fractional permission to it. And we don't care how much the fraction is, so it's an underscore. This means give me some fraction of the permission to access this set, so we can read the set but not modify it. And we will give back uh, some fractional permission. Uh, the same for intersects. We require access to the set, to this set, as well as to the other set, and we give it back. Um, so now, what is the theory underlying that? It's as follows, or actually, I think it's just that this 
title is in the wrong place. Okay, we're already in the, in the middle of uh, explaining this. So what is an implementation of this interface? What does that look like? Well, for example, for insert, we give a body to this predicate as follows. The representation of an insert object con uh, consists of the alum field. So we have to have permission to access the alum field. We don't care about its value. And separately, we have to have permission to access the set zero field. So this, by the way, this syntax for declaring a class is like Scala. So you declare the fields of the class uh, in parentheses after the class name. So this is Scala syntax for declaring fields of a class. Um, so we have access to the LM field, to the set zero field, as well as to the set object pointed to by set zero. So you can have recursion here. So set is defined in terms of set itself, but for another object in this case. But since it's an inductive predicate, so long as the recurs recursive occurrences occur in positive positions, it always has a well-defined meaning. So this is how we define uh, the representation of a set. And then the, um, the bodies of the methods can be proved easily against the specification. And the client program can also be proved easily against the specification. So if we start with nothing, we know only true. Then we create an empty object. So we get that empty is a set. Uh, we create an insert object. So we get the fields of this insert object. And we can make it more abstract by summarizing this as set2.set. .set. So we're, we're folding up the set predicate for set2. So this is the body of the set predicate for set2. And this is if we fold it up. And then the same for set3. And now if we split this into two halves, we can call it with itself. So here, this program doesn't terminate, but it's safe. So for it's the partial correctness condition holds. So we can prove it with partial correctness, even though this program doesn't terminate. Or actually, it does terminate. Sorry. So in this case, it terminates because empty and insert, uh, they terminate. Um, so the syntax of assertions is as follows. You have points to assertions, predicate calls, separating conjunction, existential quantification, and the Boolean uh, constants. The, um, the method def definitions look as follows. So you have a method header with a return type and parameter types. It requires some precondition, and it ensures some postcondition. And it has a body. So what is the meaning of assertions? The meaning of assertions is given as follows. Um, it's, it's given in terms of an interpretation i for predicates and an, an heap h, which has the contents of all the fields. So the points to assertion o.f points to v is true if the tuple o, f, v is in the heap. That is, if o.f is in the domain of the heap, and the, heaps maps, the heap maps o.f to v. A predicate uh, application is true if the application is in i, is in the interpretation of, of the predicates. So i is a parameter here. We will see later how we can define a specific interpretation for predicates. But here it's just delegated to i. And then separating conjunction is defined as follows. Uh, P1 star P2 holds in a heap H if you can split the heap into H1 and H2. So this means that H1 and H2 split the heap up. up. And uh, P1 holds for H1 and P2 holds for H2. So I is the interpretation for predicate applications. So it's a set of tuples of this form. And we will see later how we define a specific I. So if I give you the set of all predicate applications that are true, then I can define the meaning of arbitrary assertions that contain predicate applications. Um, we will see later how we actually define a particular i. You think that you want both i and h to be functional in the last component, I mean, that is, um, so that you cannot have o, f, v in being in h and also have OFB prime is a different B prime. Yes, that will always be the case. True. Yeah. That's right. So yes, this is actually 
h is actually going to be a function from o dot f pairs to values, or actually a partial function, right? So this is actually just shorthand for saying o dot f is in the domain and o dot f is mapped to v. <coughs> Um, H is a partial map from that's right. Uh, addresses to tuples of fields. Uh, well, it's a partial map from um, object reference field name pairs to values. So you can have one field of an object being in the heap and another field of the same object not being in the heap. And that will be useful uh, later. So heaps actually represent permissions to access parts of the full heap. So uh, this might be the full heap, or this might actually be a partial view of the heap, in a sense. So a part of the heap. And actually, we'll use this here, right, with the separating conjunction. Um, what you're doing here is you're interpreting P1 in one part of H and P2 in the other part of H. So if P1 talks about one field of an object, P2 should not talk about the same field, but it can talk about another field of the same object. That's the, the, the core notion of separation logic. And H is the special, special predicates, right? Um, in other separation logic papers too. Not, not really. So I will also. So these predicates, they can also talk about the heap because note that H is passed in, so it's it's part of the tuple that is either in or is not in I. So they, uh, the predicates, they bundle up a number of points to assertions. They bundle up a part of the heap. No, no, they're not duplicable because um, just because this one is in I doesn't mean that it's going to be an I if you take a smaller H. So I am just constant. It doesn't change as the program executes. That's right. It's it doesn't change. It's the interpretation of all the predicates. Yes. And H keeps changing. Yes. What about uh, local variables? Local variables are not in here. So I is not. Um, does cannot mention, so a predicate definition cannot mention a local variable. Right, but what I'm wondering is that why this left, to the left of the turnstile, you have i and h, but I was also expecting that you will have the valuation of local variables. Right, level, yes. But you don't have that. Typically you have that, but I'm, here I'm using a programming language that doesn't have mutable local variables. So you have read-only local oh. variables. So I assume they are substitute, the values are substituted into the assertions already. That simplifies some things. But yes, in general, typically in the literature, you have this. Um, all right. So that's the meaning of assertions. Now, how do we mean, uh, how do we define the meaning of um, predicates? Well, as follows. We, given if we already have an interpretation i for predicates, we can define a new interpretation, f of i, as follows. So we look at the definition of the predicate. Um, so suppose we want to know if this tuple is in f of i. So then we will look at what is the class of object O, if it's class C. Then we will look at the definition of predicate P in class C. Suppose this is the definition of that predicate there. And then we will interpret this body under i and h. And if that's true, then this tuple is in f of i. OK, so we will use i for the recursive calls in the body of the definition. And given this functor, so to speak, you can take the least fixed point. So this is the least fixed point of f, which is well defined because f is monotonic. So that's the knaster tarski theorem. Um, and so we will have the property that f of i fix equals i fix. So, so that means that it satisfies the equations that are the predicate definitions. And um, so that means that we, we can use this as a, a reasonable interpretation for predicates. So in, the, in, in further down, in further slides, I will just write this and to mean this. So it, the i fix will be implicit from now. Does, the, does this have something to do with, I think, a restriction you alluded to earlier that uh, predicates appear inside definitions of the predicates only in positive form? That's right, yes. It, it, that's a crucial restriction to make this work. Okay. So here in this syntax, you will see that 
there's no neg negative construct, so there's no uh, implication or negation in the syntax of assertions, which enforces trivially that uh, predicate calls occur only in positive positions. But is it on the that I use negation and implication all the time? Right. Well, you can use it for Boolean case. expressions, right? So they are Boolean operators. So if you just have an ex right, actually it's not, so actually if you have something that um, evaluates to either true or false, if you substitute in the local variables, then it's fine. So that's allowed. You can have false in here, right? But you can't have an, a negation or an implication that has either points to assertions or predicate calls in, in its operands. Being pull and close, but the existential variables are like you know, uninterpreted constants at the top level. Uh, maybe, yeah. <laughs> then, yeah, then what you said would be the case exactly. Okay. But actually, I will see, later I will see a way that you can still have negative facts about predicates in very fast, but it's not in this particular talk. In the next, well, the next part of the talk, in the second chapter, so to speak, I will say, uh, show how you can use. Um, ghost commands as proofs of negative facts. So you will have nested triples, you will have whole triples about ghost commands, and they can have a predicate in the precondition. And in a sense, a precondition of a triple is a negative position. So in that way, you can still have negative facts, so to speak, about predicates. OK. Um, can I just ask another question? Sure. Some of these restrictions, I imagine you're inheriting because you use separation logic. And s some of these restrictions are probably because you want this well-foundedness definition of your recursive predicates. Am I correct? Well, so the restriction on positive positions is because I want to do it, make this fixed point, right? Because I want right. this. Uh, but you also said something that that arrow thing, right? The separation logic arrow thingy cannot appear the here or there or something, right? The magic wand, I don't have it here, right? No, no but that uh, that points to you. Didn't you make a comment that the points to cannot appear in some situations? Uh, right. So the points to, I just said that it also cannot appear in negative positions here in this case. But actually, that's uh, that's not even needed to be able to make this. So actually, then why do you have that restriction? Um, actually, I've never needed a negative points to in any proofs. So I don't think it's use, particularly useful okay. to have that. Right. Uh -huh. All right. Um, so now, uh, how do we express the semantics of programs? And you can use a co-inductive semantics for that. Um, so if you run a command in a particular heap, it will have an outcome, or it can have one or more outcomes. And an outcome is either successful termination in n steps with result value v and final heap h, or failure in n steps or divergence. And we will define the notion of adding a natural number to a, an outcome. So if it's a successful outcome, then you just add it to the number of steps. The same for failure. And adding a number to divergence just means divergence. And given those definitions, we can define the meaning of a call as follows, if you perform a call in heap H, then of course you will look up the method body, um, and the, the body will depend on the parameters X. Um, you will look the met up the method body in the class of O, of course, which is C. And then if you execute this body with the arguments substituted for the parameters, then you get some outcome. So the outcome of the call is going to be 1 plus the outcome of the body. And this should be interpreted as a co-inductive rule, so with double uh, lines. And that means that if you have infinite recursion, if the body of m is itself a call of m on the same object, then uh, the only possible outcome is divergence. Right? If I didn't have this 1 plus, by the way, if I just had O here, then all possible outcomes would be allowed by the semantics. And that's why I have this 1 plus, so that you can only have divergence here, if it's an infinite recursion. All right. Um, so given that we have a notation for the meaning of programs, 
how do we define the meaning of a triple? Um, so that's defined as follows. So for partial correctness, if the precondition, so for any heap where the precondition holds, and if we get an outcome O, then either O is divergence, or we have a successful termination such that uh, the post condition holds in the post heap with the result value substituted in. Okay. That's like the obvious meaning, right? So triple is true if, if you start in any state that satisfies the precondition, running the commands will end, end up in a state that satisfies the post condition. That's, that's just what it says there, nothing else. But notice that we allow divergence here um, because this is a partial correctness semantics or a proof system. So then we want to prove that if we can prove a triple using the proof rules, then it is true. And uh, I didn't show any proof rules here, but uh, they are standard. And so then how do you prove this theorem? Well, you will prove it by induction on the number of execution steps. So you will use the following lemma. For all uh, number of steps n, uh, given a that we reach an outcome O, then it will not be failure in n steps. And if we successfully terminate in n steps, then the post condition is satisfied. And you can prove that by induction on the number of steps. All right. And then by induction, a nested induction on the derivation on the proof tree itself. So then, how do we extend this logic to deal also with total correctness? Um, what we add is just one thing, a call permission. And it will be, in the first approximation, it will be um, qualified by a natural number. Um, so actually, this simply means that we have n, that we have permission to perform n calls here. Um, so given that, the meaning of this assertion, so we will interpret the meaning of an assertion under i and h as before, but also n. So then, of course, if you claim that you have call permission n prime, then n prime has to be at least, so n has to be at least n prime. So you can have additional um, call permissions, that's fine. Separating conjunction is also interpreted in the obvious way, so you have to split not just the heap, but also the call permissions into two parts, such that p1 holds for n1 and p2 holds for n2. So they are non-duplicable, duplicable, of course, these call permissions. Um, and then the proof rule for method calls is extended so that it consumes one call permission at each call. So one call permission is taken out of the program's stock of call permissions at each call, and it's gone. And since there are only finitely many call permissions at the start of the program, it follows that the program can only perform finitely many calls. It's very simple. Um, so how do we prove th soundness for this? Um, so the meaning of a triple is exactly as before, except that we don't have this disjunct that says that we allow divergence. That's gone. And then how do we prove that given the proof rules, we have that the triple is true? Now um, we will define it. We, you will use a lemma that performs induction not on the number of steps, but on the number of calls. So n is now the number of calls. Um, and that will also work out. So you now perform induction on the number of calls. And nested, uh, you will also uh, look at the, the size of the command. So the only command where the size of the command itself doesn't decrease through execution is calls, and calls are dealt with using call permissions. So that's why this is a valid way of doing induction. All right, so now how do we use these call permissions for modular specifications? Because of course what you don't want is to have at the top of main a request for call permissions for exactly the number of calls that that particular program will make. That's not modular then you're revealing exactly how many calls you are making throughout the program. So you don't want to do that, of course. Um, consider this 
very simple program. So we have a main method that calls square root, and square root calls square root helper some number of times. So a naive way to specify, to perform modular verification of this program, is to say, oh, well, square root helper doesn't perform any calls itself, so we're going to request call permission of zero. So that's just the same as true, really, because we're not requesting anything. Um, square root, it performs two calls, so it requests call permission of two. And then main calls square root, which itself needs two call permissions, so main needs three call permissions, right? Okay, so that's, that's a valid spec, a valid proof, but it's not modular. It reveals information that we want to hide. So how do we do that? And the way to do that, actually, one other problem is that it becomes very tricky to specify Ackermann. So if you want to have a, a requires clause for this main method that calls Ackermann, the Ackermann function, which is a well-known function that uh, performs a lot of recursion, then you will need to specify the number of calls that are performed by Ackermann. And that's quite tricky. You can do it, but it's not something you want to do. So you want to be able to abstract over the precise number of calls that are made. So of course, if I talk about Ackermann, you hear me coming. I'm going to talk about ordinal numbers, about uh, lexicographic ordering. So in general, we will um, look at well-founded orders. And an order is well-founded. Well, I'm sure all of you know, but let's just quickly recall. So a relation is well, it's not necessarily even an order. A relation is well-founded, R, if uh, all non-negative, uh, non-empty subsets uh, of the domain of R have a minimal element, right? So for each non-empty set X, there is some element of X such that no element, no other element of X uh, is less than it or no element to, uh, shortly. No element of x is less than x. That's minimal, of course, minimal minimality. And that's the same as saying that there are no infinite descending chains um, of R. Um, of course, the natural numbers are well-founded. We can define well-foundedness. Given two well-founded relations, we can define the lexicographic composition of these relations. And here we will assume that the second element is the um, most significant one. So uh, either the second component of the pair decreases or uh, the second one stays the same and the first one decreases. So then we consider the, uh, this pair to be less than this pair. So 10,2 is less than 1,3. And the other thing that you can do is multiset order. So, um, so this is denoted as follows, omega to the x. That means order over sets, over multi-sets of elements of x. And then uh, the order is defined as follows. You can get from one multi-set to a smaller one by removing any element and replacing it with any number of smaller elements. So that's how you move down in the order over the multi-sets. And this is what we will use also in our proofs. Um, so we will not use just natural numbers, but ordinals to qualify call permissions. And um, so we will have, we will interpret assertions under I, H, and lambda, where lambda is a multiset of ordinals. So each element of lambda is a call permission qualified by an, some ordinal. So call permission of alpha holds under some lambda if alpha is an element of lambda. Separating conjunction is interpreted as follows. We have to be able to split lambda such that one part satisfies P1 and the other part satisfies P2. We will also allow the program to perform ghost steps that um, weaken lambda. So you can, if you have a certain stock of call permissions, you can replace any of those call permissions by any number of lesser call permissions. And that is denoted by this uh, square subset symbol. So we can go from a state satisfying assertion P to one satisfying assertion P prime if P prime is satisfied by a smaller lambda than P. 
So for example, we, have, we then have the following um, laws or facts. Call permission of one can be weakened to call permission of zero, star call permission of zero. And uh, for, uh, another example is call permission of zero, one can be weakened to call permission of 10, zero and call permission of 20, zero. Call permission of multiset three can be weakened to call permission of two, two, two and call permission of one because both of these multisets are smaller than this multiset. Is this the lambda prime lesser or equal to lambda? Is that what you want? Or do you want strictly less than? Uh, less or equal. It's fine if it's the same one. Then it's ordinary implication of assertions. So, the, um, so oh. this is one assertion implies one other assertion, right? It's, yeah. There's no star there. Um, so how do, you, how do we now use this to abstractly specify this program? And the trick here is to use method names as ordinals. So we will interpret method names, we will define an order on method names, uh, simply by the textual order of the program. So we will say, say square root helper is the minimal element, and square root is greater than square root helper, and main is greater than both square root and square root helper. And using these, this order, we can, use, uh, we can define call permissions as follows. So we'll use the method names as the set of ordinals. So main, and in all programs that you will see from now on, main will always require simply a call permission for itself, for program.main. So, that, so the, the, the specification for the main method doesn't reveal anything about what the program does internally, how many calls it makes. It always simply requires main. Since main calls square root, it needs, and square root itself, so by the way, more generally, any method will simply require a call permission qualified by its own name. So square root, square root will require call permission of square root, square root helper will require call permission of square root helper. So if main wants to call square root, it needs to weaken its own call permission to two call permissions over square root. Why two? One of them is consumed by the call itself. So remember the proof rule that we saw before? Uh, in a call is valid if the precondition holds, and separately we have an extra call permission which is consumed and lost forever. So that's why main has to be weakened to two instances of square root. One of them is lost, and the other one is passed into the body of square root to satisfy uh, its precondition. And square root itself will also weaken its own permission to two copies of square root helper. And then square root helper will simply not use its call permission, but that's fine, of course. So now how do we verify or and specify Ackermann? Ackermann itself, so the general rule is if you have recursive functions or recursive methods, they should be internal to a module. So that means that the specification of the recursive method itself doesn't have to be abstract. It, 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 it is okay for it to reveal the structure of the implementation, to be implementation specific. So what you then do is you have a separate method, a separate public method that, is, that has an abstract specification. So Ackermann itself requires simply uh, math.ackerman. Here we have given a little bit more structure to the call permissions. We're not using just method names, but also local ranks. So now uh, the ordinals used to qualify call permissions are pairs of local ranks and method names. And the local ranks are the, the usual kinds of ranking functions that you use to verify correct, uh, termination of recursive methods. Yes? Does this mean that when I implement an interface, I need to respect the order of the interface methods, how they were declared in the interface? Because in my implementation, they're going to have to be in the same order to get the same uh, ordinals? Um, yes, but that can easily be, um, you can easily work around that by having the, in, the implementations of the interface methods call into private, other private methods that are above all of the interface implementations. So well, that way, they, all have to be less. They, can't. they are all less. They, they will all be less than the interface implementation have. methods, and therefore they can. You can call any of the implementation methods in any of the interface methods. 
right? So you simply duplicate all of the methods, and then it's, there's no problem. So it's not a, a fundamental restriction in that way. Um, so, okay, how do we then verify Ackermann? So Ackermann itself and the general rule will be public methods simply require a call permission qualified by zero comma its own name. So this doesn't reveal any information about the contents. And then the recursive method will have a call permission for Ackermann iter and as the local rank, uh, the rank that is appropriate for Ackermann, namely the two arguments lexicographically sorted. So Ackermann weakens its own uh, permission to MN Ackermann iter, which is less than Ackermann because the second component is the most significant one. And Ackermann iter is less than Ackermann. So it can choose anything for the local rank when it performs this weakening. Okay, then the really hard part is dynamic binding. So, yes? Recursion. Right, mutual recursion is done by, um, so each, each of these mutually recursive methods will request permission for the bottom one, for the greatest one. Yeah, yeah. In the paper there's an example uh, like that. Uh, so how do we do a dynamic binding? Um, so suppose, so here I, here I have an al another example that uses dynamic binding. So we have an interface for real functions. You can apply it to a double to get another double. And then we have a, a method, a static method, that performs integration, that computes the in, an, an approximation of the integral over f between some bounds, a and b. So it's going to have to call f a number of times. How do we specify these methods? So here's a first attempt. Well, actually, no, this is just a partial correctness specification that we, like we saw before. So we define a predicate in RealFunk, and apply will require this predicate. It doesn't actually give anything back, because since this is just a fractional permission, the caller can always keep another fraction for further calls. So it doesn't have to give anything back. Uh, integrate also will require a fractional permission for f. So in the partial correctness setting, this is sufficient. This allows integrate to call f any number of times. Now, if we also want to prove termination, how do we do this? Um, of course, apply will want to be able to perform static calls of things declared earlier, like we saw before, like square root needs to be able to call square root helper. So it will, so it will by the ordinal, ordinary rule that we saw before, apply should request a call permission for zero comma its own name. And we can, um, so this, this dot apply means actually class of this dot apply. So this is the name of the specific apply uh, method that implements this interface method. So this is not one name for the interface method itself. This is the name for the class method that implements this interface method. And uh, so then integrate should by the ordinal, ordinary rule that we saw before, it should request call permission for itself, so that itself can call methods before it, and also call permission for f.apply. However, this is not sufficient. Um, specifically, consider the following implementation of integrate. So integrate will call a recursive helper function that um, recursively applies f to some a value between a and b, um, and then recursively calls itself uh, again, right? as you would expect. Now the problem is, what we said here, this spec allows f.apply to be called only once. Because f.apply, so if you go back to the spec, f.apply requires this full call permission that we're passing in here. So after the first call, it will be completely consumed. So this is not sufficient. A specifically, integrate iter will need n copies of f.apply, for n being the recursive argument here that is descending during the recursion. So how do we fix that? And we cannot, of course, we could just put like omega here, the first infinite ordinal. But, if you, but that restrains the implementation. Uh, if, for example, if you want to call this inside of Ackermann, then you don't need omega. You would like something bigger than omega. So, okay, can we put the biggest ordinal? 
that there is no such thing as the biggest ordinal. Um, so that's not, there's no good modular way to fix this without, again, using method names. Um, and I will show how. So the way to do that is to not use local ranks, pairs of local ranks and method names as ordinals, but local ranks and bags of method names, so multi-sets of method names. So you do it as follows. Uh, integrate. So uh, for f dot apply itself, we simply require the singleton multiset this dot apply. But for integrate, we will require uh, the multiset containing two elements, integrate itself and f dot apply. And this allows integrate to weaken this permission to an arbitrary local rank when it goes from integrate to integrate iter. So when you we can integrate f apply to integrate iter f apply, you can choose an arbitrary local rank. And this allows you to perform this call. And here you can perform any number of calls um, that you need. Now this still doesn't, now we still haven't achieved a fully general uh, specification. Um, because f dot apply can only perform static calls here, given this, per given this permission. It cannot perform any dynamically bound calls on objects that it refers to by its fields. So if it has a reference to another object, then it cannot call that object because it doesn't know that th the methods of that object are statically below itself. So here, too, we need to pass not just this dot apply, but some arbitrary extra set of method names. Um, so this is an example of an implementation of real func that calls into other objects. So this uh, real func defined as the sum of two other real funks. When, it, when you apply it, it will call f1.apply plus f2.apply. So that one isn't supported by the spec that we just saw. So how do we fix that? So this, by the way, is the partial correctness specification for the sum class. So its predicate real func will have the permission to access field f1, and it will have the real func predicate for f1. It will also have permission to access f2 and the real func pred predicate for f2. Um, so as I said, this is not going to be enough to verify this body. What we then do is we uh, expose from the real func predicate the bag of methods uh, reachable by the object. So each object will expose to its clients abstractly the bag of method reachable from it. This in itself sounds very breaking of information hiding, but it isn't because we're not saying anything about what this bag is. We just allow the client to name it. We just allow it to be mentioned in specifications, but we're not going to say anything about what is in there and what is not in there. So the spec for apply now becomes as follows. We have, as just, for the partial, just as for partial correctness, we have a fractional permission on this dot real func. And now we bind this method bag D. And then we say we have call permission for all of those methods D. So this is a multiset. This will, of course, include apply itself. So for the sum, we define it as follows. On the previous slide, where is D bound? It's, it's, a, well, it's, a, an ex, it's a logical, logical variable? Yes, it? that's right. Um, so how do we define the predicate for the sum example? So um, as before, sum needs to have access to f1 and to the real func of f1. And now we name the method bag of f1 as d1. We name the method bag of f2 as d2. And our own d is going to be our own apply method, multiset union d1, multiset union d2. And this way, Apply can call all of the methods of f1 and f2, and it can c apply statically higher methods of itself. Um, so now the proof is easy. Because thanks to the fact that both d1 and d2 are smaller than d, because you can at least remove this element, uh, you can weaken this call permission to all of the call permissions required for the recursive calls. Um, so this becomes the general specification for real func. And the specification for integrate now becomes as follows. Uh, we need 
the real funk predicate for f, it will have some bag of methods d, and we need call permission for ourselves to integrate multiset union d. So these are actually all of the methods reachable by integrate. These are the met this actually represents the methods statically above integrate, and this represents the methods reachable through the f object. Um, so we can prove the implementation of integrate as follows. Integrate iter will, have a requ will require call permission local rank n and method bag integrate iter union d. Um, so how do we use, what is some client code that uses this specification? So we have a program main that will perform the integration of some linear function defined by some coefficient a and some constant b. So it will create a number of those linear functions and will then also create a sum object over those linear functions and then we'll call integrate. So how do we verify total correctness of this client program? Um, the class linear itself will have to have an implementation of the real func predicate. It's easy. So it has to have access to a and b and its own method bag will simply be its own apply method. And then the proof outline for the main function looks as follows. So main simply requires call permission for itself. Um, so we have, if we create a linear object, we get a real func with method bag linear.apply. We create another one, so we have also real func for linear.apply again for F2. And then when we create a sum, we also have a real func for sum.apply and then two copies of linear.apply. Um, right, and, and we can then weaken the call permission for main to two copies of call permission for sum.apply and two times linear.apply. That allows us to perform this integrate call. So does this work because all these implementations know statically how many method calls they need to make? I understand, I suppose it, it was, um, instead of a linear function, something that took, a, I don't know, some dynamic data structure, mm -hmm. and it needed to call as many as there were in its dynamic chain. Right, but isn't that like the sum object? So sum is built from linear objects and it doesn't know itself that it's built from linear objects? It knows it only has two. Yeah. It knows it, well, I mean, they can themselves be, again, sums, for example, right? Yeah, that's true. So in that sense. Mm -hmm. All right, this is actually I think the end, well actually there's one more problem remaining. Here I am, uh, I know what happens at construction time, so I want, also want to abstract over what happens at construction time. Um, I can do it as follows. So what does a constructor function or a constructor method for linear look like? It will require call permission for itself simply. Actually I forgot the zero here. And it will say I will give you a f a, an object that satisfies the real func predicate for some d and d will be less than myself. And thanks to this information, so here we don't know the exact value of d, but we have an upper bound for it, and that allows the main function to weaken its own call permission to a call permission for d. Uh, and sim similar for sum, so create sum will require the usual call permissions for uh, f1 and f2, and it will give back an object whose method bag is less than create sum union d1, union d2. So that's uh, all I wanted to say about modular termination verification. And I see now that it's been an hour already. So I guess the other topics we should leave for some other time. All right, thank you very much. You're free to ask questions for, uh, about Andy and Bart is here uh, today and, um, and tomorrow. So if you want to chat with him about those, he's given us a good taste of that. But any other questions now about them? So I, your examples have a functional language flavor where you're allocating new data types and then putting those together to make bigger and bigger data types. Mm -hmm. and, and you seem to support that very well. Is that, is that all it supports? Mm -hmm. um, no. So uh, the, the logic fully supports mutation. And uh, I mean, I don't see it at this point any reasons why the, I mean, the, the specification style also should not support mutation.
for example, these predicates, it's perfectly fine for them to for the arguments to change as you mutate the data structures. Yeah, but at some point, mutation get you into trouble, and you can create circular lists. And right. Things that yeah. Right. Where does that show up? And, and right. Mix? So, well, actually, this already uh, shows you how circularity would uh, would be shown. Um, so, but actually, if you create a circular list, then I would say that you that you know that you're doing that. Um, so it would be within one module, and then uh, you know how many elements it has. So um, I think that wouldn't be a problem. This is if you, if you deliberately want to create. This yes. Thing. Yes. I mean, what if you accidentally did it using bad mutation? Right. Right. Um, of course, it's ruled out. I mean, yeah. non-termination. This is sound, so there's, you definitely cannot prove the program. The question is, can you? Um, the question is then, I mean, if, the, if if it doesn't terminate, then you cannot prove it, right? Yeah. So, what do you still want to prove about it? That's the question. Then, I guess. Well, I guess my question is more: um, how, how does that look to the programmer when they encounter this? What, what what is the specific problem that they run into when they're trying to write this? Mm -hmm. um, so it's yeah, it's hard to to tell. It's going to fail. Um, yeah, I guess I would have to try it to to really be able to answer that. Yeah. But note that of course these multi sets, these bags are finite things. So. They would have trouble to create an infinite such bag. So you'd have to, they would have to, during creation, they would have to have some well founded process to come up with these bags. Yeah. That would be impossible, I guess. Right? So technically, when you, when you implement this, um, how do you handle stuff like? My program makes a system called that can return string values, and if the system will returns one particular value loops independently, and otherwise returns immediately. Right. Um, so this is for proving termination, right? So does that program terminate? Well, I guess not always. But then you cannot verify it. You have to know that it terminates, right? Otherwise, you cannot verify that it terminates. I, I suppose you're not shooting for maximal provability, which allows you to prove anything you want. Only if it terminates, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. There are some verifiers like that, too. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so Bart will be around. So, um, thanks.